Welcome to this gathering of Connection Church. And thank you for your financial support, which allows us to serve you and keep being the church. Good morning, everybody. If you're still getting settled, that's fine. Uh, I'm just going to kind of jump right in. There's uh, quite a few things today that I want to just share with you. And uh, obviously, uh, you're here today for a reason. You came in probably with a reason. I just want to open up this idea that God has you here for something perhaps much deeper than that. Um, I want to share with you a different introduction than I had planned. Uh, This morning I woke up and I had a dream last night. And I want to share with you a little bit of the dream. It didn't involve like a pirate ship and poodles and squirrels. It wasn't anything weird like that. But, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever had somebody try to share with you one of those dreams and like after a half hour you're like, I don't know, whatever just happened. So, um, but... uh, this was a dream about, about this time. Uh, actually, specifically, it was a dream about uh, when I was getting ready to get up and teach first service today. So I had a dream about what I was going to do today that I actually just did an hour ago. Um, so I want to bring you in the loop on what the dream was. I was in the back of the room, and uh, just as this moment ended, the band was kind of done playing, I was making my way up to, to the front, and I was about a third of the way from the back, and I noticed that the posture of most of the people in the room was very relaxed. And it wasn't like everybody was comfortable, which is a good thing, like, you know, in a, in a good, comfortable way. It was like um, high school uh, classroom, back of the room, class, teacher, you know, feet up like this. And, um, and there was enough of that going on that I, I literally was like, whoa, what's going on in the room? And, uh, and I often will do this. I'll just kind of, it's, it's like a Wi-Fi moment with God. I'm like, God... What do you want to have happen here? Do you want me to do anything different? And so uh, I ended up sitting down in, uh, in the midst of all that. I sat with everyone who was kind of doing that. And again, this is weird because sometimes in your dream, you're not quite conscious of why you're doing certain things. But in this particular moment, I was. I was sitting down, and I, and I just kind of joined in. So in this moment right now, where there would be teaching, I was sitting in the back of the room in my dream, just sort of doing this, which made a few people uncomfortable. It made, it made this like little weird vibe in the room because people expected me to do something and there was this awkward silence up front. And so uh, there was, you know, people shifting around. People were like, should we, is he teaching back there today? You know, should we look at him? Um, folks that had invited guests were noticeably embarrassed because they had invited their guests. A couple people uh, stood up to fix the situation. I won't tell you who they were. They're real people that actually attend this church. They stood up to fix the situation. Um, and uh, so much so that, like, uh, in the middle of all that, uh, some folks got up and left. They were frustrated. They were angry with what was happening. And so, um, so the, the few folks that were kind of fixing things, they uh, got on the phone and they called all those people. And they're like, no, you need to come back. We're going to make sure this doesn't happen. We're going to find out what's going on. Second service, it's going to be a lot different. And, and sort of just, um, uh, you know, we're trying to fix things. So I went outside. Again, this is, like, just the tail end of my dream. I went outside. We had a parking garage for some reason, which is weird. No squirrels or poodles, but there was a parking garage. And, um, and uh, as a family was coming back, because they were frustrated, as a family was coming back in, uh, one of the teenagers in our church uh, sort of just stopped and said, okay, that was just really weird, and I need to know that that's not going to happen again because I don't want to waste my time. And, uh, you know, and that's when I woke up. Um, now, I want to share that with you today, because today we're going to talk about something much more important than that dream, but I think it's sort of that dream symbolizes something. I don't know how, what you believe about dreams. I don't know if you believe God speaks to you in dreams, or if sometimes your, you know, your current relationship with God just informs your dreams. I don't know what you think or feel about that. I'm just telling you about a dream I had. And I want to share that with you, because um, God has something much larger to share with you today. And, and it involves those awkward moments when he doesn't do things the way that you're supposed to. See, as a teacher, like a, somebody who teaches God's word, I'm not just up here today to tell you what's on my paper. I've certainly spent time and I've worked ahead, but I want to share with you what's in God's word. And, and so I might deviate from that if as the Holy Spirit is sort of directing me, he's like, you need to go this way today. So, uh, so I wanted to share with you that dream, uh, because sometimes there are awkward moments in service where you don't know what to say or what to do. In fact, Jesus himself would do this. There were times when people would come to Jesus with, with a problem they wanted a systematic, concrete answer for. 
One of these situations, a woman was caught in adultery, and they brought her before Jesus. And Jesus, the first thing he does isn't, all right, let me tell you what everything is. Let me tell you the truth. Let me debate with you. He, start, he bends down. He starts writing in the sand, which is a very weird response for somebody who has the opportunity to save this woman's life. For Jesus, who we would expect would be like superhero Jesus, right? He, he would, the first thing he's going to do is stand up for what's right. And, but no, instead, he just starts writing in the sand. And everybody for centuries has been trying to figure out what he was drawing in the sand. Nobody knows, but we know that he did. Um, there was another situation where Jesus was uh, in a certain area, Tyre and Sidon, and he's walking kind of outside the realm of Jerusalem. And, uh, and a woman comes up to him, and she's begging for healing. And it says in the scriptures... Jesus was silent. She's not just begging for healing for herself, but for her daughter. And instead of responding in the way that you would expect Jesus to respond, is the Bible says that Jesus was silent. Now, in both of these passages, things continue. He eventually does engage with the situation. But his first response is often not what we expect. So I want to just propose to you a question today, and you don't have to answer it out loud, but I would like for you to wrestle with it. When have there been times in your life when you've expected God to respond in a certain way, and when he didn't, it was just really awkward? It made the whole situation awkward. So much so, you, you just wanted to get up and leave. And you wanted to leave your faith behind and just say, this is not what I signed up for. I did not sign up for this experience. When has there been times even like your church experience ends up being something that you wouldn't systematically want? Because, you know, we all like a system. But, um, but you just receive it and you go, well, I don't know what to do with that. Let me give you an example. Uh, be the church. He said it. He hasn't said it all month. Be the church. See, if you're new to Connection Church, if you don't know this, I would end every service with this little phrase, be the church. And uh, I started saying it actually back in our movie theater days, my my first Sunday at uh, at Connection Church. I was was wrestling in my own life with this idea that I don't want to just go to church and be done with my church experience. I want to be the church. And so I ended my first message with, uh, with this phrase. And then over the next couple of weeks, it started being like this echo. Like I would say it and the church would say it back. And, and we, you know, it was kind of like a high five on the way out. Let's remember to be the church. In fact, as you leave this hallway, if you look up, there's two signs. Not everybody gets this. It says, as you, and then there's an exit sign. So as you exit, be the church. And some of you are like, as you be the church, I don't understand. You look at the exit sign in the middle. As you exit, be the church. I just blew somebody's mind who's been here for a long time and didn't understand that. Um, so, uh, so here's the thing. Um, I, at the front end of this month, when I was getting ready to come back from being off in July, took a sabbatical, and again, thank you for that gift. Uh, when I came back, I had this leading from God to not say, be the church at the end of service, which was weird, and I didn't understand it, but I've learned not to arm muscle with him because he wins, so I usually knows what he's doing. So I said, okay. And again, I'm like, how do you know that was God? We could talk for hours about that. The bottom line is I'm learning to trust in those nudges, and it usually ends up that if it balances out with Scripture, and, it, and if I'm like, okay, really, this is coming out of my relationship with God, we could talk about that at another time. But I had this conviction, so I did it. And uh, it took three and a half weeks. I just got an email this last week for somebody to email me, finally, and ask me about it. And just say, uh, you know, I'm sure you got a reason, but just so you know, uh, it's really awkward at the end of service because you're not saying be the church, and we don't know when we're supposed to, if we're, are we supposed to say it? Uh, should, should, like, we just get up and go? Like, it's just been awkward. And then somebody else, you know, in the conversation said, said, yeah, like, I've heard, like, a lot of people are really wondering, like, it's just weird, and, you know, it's this culture we've created. And I didn't know until yesterday why I wasn't saying it. I want to, I want to take a, a long journey around To that point, there's some other and more important stuff we've got to talk about first. So if you have a Bible, I want to ask you to open up to Acts chapter 2 with me. And I want to share with you um, something we've been reading this month, but a little bit more than that. Acts chapter 2 is a chronicle of the early church, the early Christians. It talks about what they did and what their priorities were. And so we've been really reading and honing in on the last passage uh, of Acts chapter 2, that last little section there, talking about the the thousands of people that came to Christ, as well as the early Christians and disciples and apostles themselves. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. 
All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now we've usually stopped there. Let's keep reading. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from him. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now skip ahead just a little bit further to the end of Acts chapter 4. Listen to this. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Lots of great stuff going on in the early church. Here's sort of the, the, the thing I want to hone in on today. The proclamation of who Jesus Christ is, the, the saying out loud of what you have learned about Jesus, testifying, evangelism, whatever the word is that you want to use. We're going to hone in on this today. And in, 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 in the time we have here, my hope is that we will launch out and all go share our faith today. Now, in saying that, a number of you cringe like I would if somebody were to say that to me. What does this mean? What, 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 what are we going to do? I didn't sign up for that today. I know you didn't sign up for that. That's, I, that's fine. Because we're all afraid of becoming street evangelists. We're all afraid of being that guy on the corner who's got a Bible, who's, you know, his cars are going by, is doing this thing and this thing and this thing. I know this because yesterday I drove by one in Fairlawn. And you know me, I had to stop and have a conversation with him. So I did. And, um, and, and so I went up to him and I, you know, I, I walked up and I said, so hey, what's your message? You know, and he's like, People need Jesus. And I'm like, okay, tell me more. And we did. And after I heard him for a while, I said, you know, I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow with my church. Would you mind sharing a message with my church? In fact, can I record it? And he's like, absolutely. So it's a little windy, but I think you'll get the gist of it. I want you guys to meet the gentleman I met yesterday. Okay, so uh, this is Tim. And uh, Tim, what are you doing here today? I'm out here at uh, Fairlawn, just uh, street preaching, giving the gospel out to folks who uh, want it and who need it. Okay. Have you had any problems so far being out here? Uh, I've had a problem uh, a couple weeks ago. I had uh, a couple of ladies that got mad at me, so they called the cops on me. Uh, so the cops came out. They had no problem with it whatsoever. They just had to come check it out. Uh, but they just came and you know, asked me what I was doing. I was just saying, I'm out here just to give the gospel. I'm not out here to get people mad or anything like that. Or, uh, I'm not you know, full of hatred. I'm out here because I, I love these people's souls. I don't want to see him go to hell, so that's that's why we come out here. Uh, we try to every Saturday. That's great. Okay, and so, um, what message would you have for us as a church? As a church, I'd have to say this: is that the most important thing, other than your relationship with Jesus Christ, with reading your Bible and praying, would be your witness in your community. And what I mean by that is when you go throughout your day-to-day basis, and uh, I know you're busy with work and family and all that, but the problem is this. Is you ought to not just see people as people. You have to see them as souls destined for an eternity without Jesus Christ. And what are you going to do about it if you don't stand up and say something about what the gospel says, what the word of God has given us to say? And the, we need to, as Christians, we've been given that to go out and to preach the gospel to every creature. And you as a Christian need to come 
uh, out as much as you can. I don't care if it's at work, at the grocery store, if it's your neighbors, if it's family members. If you know somebody that's not saved, that's not going to heaven, you need to be a witness to them. Great way to do that is, uh, like you're trying to, is become friends with a person and try to get an open door there. But it's also great to come out and be a, a light to a, a lost and dying world and give out the gospel uh, as much as you can. Is this is this easy for you or is this a choice? Uh, it's a it's a choice for me. I mean, just like anything spiritual, your flesh is not going to want to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of guy I don't like bugging people. I don't like going to people's houses on Thursday night, and knocking on doors, and bugging them. And I don't like coming out here and have to raise my voice to street preach. But you know what? It's needful, and God has called me to do this, and I have to do it because if I don't do it, who will? And you need to come out in your community and be a witness because if you don't, who's going to tell those people about Jesus? Who's going to tell them about heaven and hell? Who's going to tell them about the truth that God has given us in His Word? That's great. Thanks, Tim, for your time. Yep. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, you know, we look at that, a lot of us look at that, and, and the first thought is, well, that's the wrong way to do it. You're really not going to, you know, have a whole lot of success with that. There's much better ways to share your faith. And, you know, we would make a good argument that way. Now, whatever your preferred way of evangelism it is, um, Tim, this summer, has led eight people to the Lord on the street corner. How many people has your method allow you to lead to the Lord this summer? Thanks for the honesty. Um, we are a culture of validation, and we will talk ourselves into watering down any fire in this area because we just don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to come across as, you know, some brainwashed Christian who's out there doing what you're supposed to be doing. And yet here's a guy, we were talking about this. Um, he told me about a teenager, in fact, that he prayed with, and he's like, He's like, I saw him again. He goes, and I, and I don't know if you believe me, but there was something different about him. Like you, however you want to read that. Here's the thing. You know, we fear doing bad evangelism, and so we do the worst kind. We say nothing. And I, I'm under conviction, by the way, as I share these words. Um, now, hang on to that. I want to share with you something else. Jerry, can you come on up? Um, Jerry Velko is a part of our leadership team, our lead team, and kind of as a point person for our core team. Uh, something, something from your summer. God promises grace and peace for those that believe in him. I'm allergic to bees. I carry an EpiPen with me wherever I go because I am allergic. I, be, I usually get stung once or twice a year. It just happens to me. Bees don't like me. July 13th, Sunday. Uh, after service, when home was working in the garden with Maggie, walking through one of the flower beds doing some weeding, and I stepped on a yellow jacket nest in the ground, stung five times, went into anaphylactic shock, ambulance was taking me to the hospital, and they actually saved my life. They revived me. If you don't know anaphylactic shock, if you get the allergic reaction, you rash all over the body, burning, nausea, lightheadedness, drop in blood pressure, failure of your respiratory, and then you go into heart attack. I had all that but the last one. Um, talked to my doctors on Monday, one of my family doctors, then the allergist later in the week, and both of them looked at the results from my hospital ride, the charts, and they said, you're lucky to be alive. Both of them said that to me. I disagree with them, even though I do respect them. I think it was God's grace that kept me and revived me with the paramedics there. An interesting thing happened on Monday after it all transpired. I looked back on what happened. In the ambulance, I was talking to the paramedics like I'm talking to you right now. I didn't go into full shock yet. But my body was shutting down. I was nauseated. I had a rash throughout the body, swelling everywhere. Uh, difficulty breathing. Lost my eyesight and was losing my hearing. All that while... I did not have any fear. I had memory of remembering Maggie and Justin, my wife and my son. Thought of no one else. It was perfect, calm peace. Now, the thoughts of them was love. I didn't see their faces. It was just a, a feeling of love. I didn't have feelings of regret or fear as far as what's, what's going to happen to them, even though I know what was transpiring in my body. 
That is God's promise of peace for those that know him. And I'm very thankful that he provided me that opportunity to experience that. It's something that I think I'm convicted now not to keep quiet about. Why should I hold back the truth about God from anyone? Who, someone else may face the same situation. Jerry, you, you, uh, you got to the point where you said, I mean, basically everything short of a heart attack. Right. Your body was shutting down. You right. were, that was it. Right. And so you're back. Right. Okay. Jerry, thanks for sharing your story. Appreciate it. Um, now, um, I called Jerry two days later. And I expected him to answer the phone because I didn't know this had happened. I mean, you know, Jerry's just going to answer the phone. It's not like anything bad would ever happen to Jerry, right? And he answered the phone. We had a conversation, and we were done. And he didn't tell me any of this until I got back. I'm like, how did you not tell me? I called you two days after it happened. He's like, well, I didn't want to worry you and all that stuff. And I appreciate that. But, um, but what spoke to me was I just assumed Jerry was going to answer the phone. I mean, there's people in your life. You just assume they're going to be there today. They're going to be there when you call them on the phone. But one of my good friends, short of the paramedic saving him, was on his deathbed. The Bible says that it is appointed for us. It is destined for us to die. That we have a destiny. There is a time and a place that God has said, you know, out of your life, this is, this is when, as I look at the scheme of things, this is when you are done. Your body is done on this earth. Some people believe he chooses that for us. Some people believe he just knows it. But it says this. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him, to bring that peace that all of us want now, but hope we have when we face that moment. And we never know when it's going to happen for us or for someone else. So um, as I challenge you today, and again, I'm just going to uh, reiterate the challenge. As I challenge you today to think about sharing your faith with people, some of you go, well, I don't know what my, what my faith is. I don't know if I have faith to share. I don't even know where I would begin. And what am I even sharing to begin with? In a lot of ways, you're like a group of farmers who have never tasted the thing that they're farming. In fact, there's a great video that I want to share with you as sort of our last metaphor uh, as we get ready to close here. Um, and as we do that, you're going to um, get one of these things. Uh, Chris is going to walk around and pass these things out. There might be some at your table. It's a little bean. You're going to get one of these. But let's watch this together. Chers amis de Metropolis, bonjour. Avec une production estimée à environ 1,6 million de tonnes, la Côte d'Ivoire est le premier producteur mondial et exportateur de fèves de cacao, un ingrédient qui rentre dans la composition du chocolat. The cacao is a milliarder business, die de wereld verdeelt in sloepers en in sloepers. Wij Westerlingen hebben de luxe om van chocolat te kunnen genieten. Maar die luxe is hier in die voorkust bij cacaoboeren zoals Unda Alfonse ver te zoeken. Je suis en train de chercher un peu de cacao. Vous voyez, ça là, sur le chocolat, cette année-là, je n'ai rien eu. Et puis, prix de cacao là aussi, c'est pas monté, on ne sait pas comment faire. Alphonse est un van de 700.000 kleine boeren, werkzaam in de Ivoriaanse cacao teelt. Hij oogst en droogt de bonen, maar hij kan er zelf geen chocolat van maken. Donc, on est, on est, on est avec là, les, ces fèves là. Est-ce que vous savez ce qu'on en fait? En tout cas, nous, on ne sait pas comment on prend cacao là même pour feu. Comme on dit de printer cacao là, on est là pour printer cacao. Parce qu'on parle que cacao là c'est un magie, mais nous on ne connaît pas comment on prend pour faire. D'accord, moi j'ai une surprise pour vous. Ouais. J'ai là dans, dans ma poche là, mmh. vous voyez ça c'est du chocolat. Ouais. C'est avec ça qu'on, c'est à partir de ce fèvre là qu'on qu fait ça. Ah bon, c'est du chocolat Oui. Et... Pour goûter voir. Ah bon. Non, prenez ça pour vous, allez-y. C'est doux. Oh, c'est doux là. Vous aimez C'est très intéressant. Il y a un cacao là, ça, ça bon truc. Ah bon On mange. Vous aimez ça Vraiment, oui, vraiment on aime. Vous, vous, vous n'avez jamais goûté au chocolat Non, non. On n'a jamais goûté au chocolat. Si c'est pas aujourd'hui. Onda verbouwt al jaren cacao, maar heeft dus nog nooit chocolat van dichtbij gezien. Het enige wat hij doet is zijn bonen afleveren bij de tussenhandelaar. Maar nu hij ervan geproefd heeft, is hij meteen zo enthousiast dat hij vindt dat al zijn vrienden het moeten proeven. Bonjour, papa. Bonjour. 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 Bonjour.
C'est Chocolade is nauwelijks verkrijgbaar in die voorkust. Bovendien is het daar relatief duur. Een chocoladereep kost hier 2 euro per stuk. En Alfonso verdient maar 7,50 euro per dag. Van dat geld moet hij 15 gezinsleden onderhouden en betaalt hij 4 arbeiders. We zijn op de kleine plantage van Oendal Fonds, die druk bezig is om samen met zijn arbeiders de rijpe cacaovruchten te oogsten. Alors expliquez-nous qu'est-ce que vous faites là en ce moment Pour que je ne rentre pas dedans. Pour, pour ça remonter bien. Ici, c'est un petit jour avant de venir. Zo begint iedere reep chocolade als een bergje bonen op een bedje van bananenbladeren. Maar ook hier op de plantage blijken de arbeiders niet op de hoogte van het verdere verloop van de wereldwijde chocoladeketen. Alors le cacao, est-ce que vous savez ce qu'on en fait? On plante le cacao, nous on ne sait pas ce que le cacao s'en va faire. Alors Alphonse, l'année surprise, le, le cacao, alors les gens l'utilisent pour faire le, le chocolat. Tenez ça, mm-hmm. vous ne pouvez pas voir. Mm-hmm. Non, c'est manger pour les bras. Mm-hmm. C'est ça qui s'appelle chocolat. Mm-hmm. C'est le cacao en bras pour faire. Ngamo, je vais quand même à Alfons en zijn harde werkers hebben de smaak meteen goed te pakken en zijn blij met iedere reep die ze gratis krijgen. What a brilliant example of what this looks like. Now, um, we talk about what we're excited about, right? We talk, I mean, if you, if you tasted something incredible, if you're like, oh, there's this new pizza place, there's this new chocolate store that opened up, you gotta, you gotta go, you gotta just have it. Like, we talk about what we're excited about. So are you excited about Jesus? For real. Are you excited about Jesus? Because if so, um, today is your challenge. Today, you take this bean to somebody, and, and I'll give you a simple out. If you're afraid of talking to people you know, you take this bean to a convenience store, and you go to the person working behind the counter, and you say, man, there's all kinds of chocolate here. Like, I don't know, what's your favorite? Well, I don't know, I like Nestle Crunch. All right. And you grab a Nestle Crunch bar, and you buy it. And then when you're done, you say, this is for you. You know, uh, I'm going to tell you just real quickly about this bean. This bean, if you were to eat this bean, is bitter. And I don't know if you feel right now like life is bitter. And, uh, you know, it's packed with nutrients. Sometimes when life is bitter, it's packed with nutrients. But um, it's bitter. But 
with the right process, it can become something sweet. And I want to give you this bean, and I want to give you this, this chocolate as a gift. In fact, I want to tell you about a process that um, I'm a part of. I go to this church. These orange papers are at your table. I go to this church. We're starting a series next week about tough questions. And if you have questions about God, we'd love for you to come as you are. So I want to give this to you too. I'm sorry for taking up your time. Sorry for holding up the line. You guys are all invited too. But um, just wanted to pass this along to you. I mean, what if evangelism is just like that? Or what if God does call you to stand on a corner with the Bible? What if God um, wants you to do this bean thing at work? I I don't know. Um, I can give you another one if you want. But I would just say, what about today? My friend Jerry is still alive. I'm so grateful. But um, I'm even more grateful that he's actually alive alive. And, um, and if you haven't tasted Jesus yourself, if you're like the workers today, I would just, um, ask you to look at your bean. This bean of where life is right now can be quite bitter, but with the right process, God can turn it into something sweet. He can, he can even find a way to make it nutritious, which is crazy. His process keeps it nutritious, but, um, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So, are you excited about Jesus? Now, um, I want to pray. I want to offer you um, just the chance to connect with God. I'm going to share uh, a 30-second thought, and, and then we're going to close. Lord, a lot of us right now, we receive a challenge like this, and we don't know what to do with it because um, we, like the workers, are just putting in our time, and uh, life isn't much more than what we can see in front of us. Thank you for uh, this is metaphor of a chocolate missionary who comes in and shares the bigger picture. And Lord, I, I thank you that you did that for us, that you have come to earth to share the good news, to make our lives sweet and good. On behalf of anyone here today who's feeling bitter, who's feeling alone, we reach out to you. We thank you for the sacrifice that you gave us on the cross and for the life that you have resurrected and made possible for us to have. And Lord, for those of us who have tasted and known that you are good, but maybe we've just forgotten how sweet it is, turn us into missionaries today. Help us to claim the ground that you've given us to, in this community, see greater things that have yet to come. On behalf of these things we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to put your eyes up here as a closing thought, and uh, let's watch this. Before you're dismissed, before short conversations, the door, the engines hiss, before Sunday lunch, Sunday nap, Sunday that, Sunday this, before your errands and plans and inevitable to-do list, before you wake up tomorrow just to forget whatever you promised, whatever God taught us, whatever you've jotted down on your journal, phone, or wrist, before you're dismissed, I just want to say that Christianity is not what you've done here today. This was half a percent of your week. 168 hours minus 56 for sleep, 112 to be alive, and this one that's now complete is supposed to spread like yeast to make leaven the loaf of the other 111? Which begs the question, are you trying to do in one day what God has meant for seven? So before you're dismissed, be reminded of this. Church is not only what you've just experienced, but exists in a life outside these walls that hears the words of Christ and answers their calls. So before you go about your other 111, remember that only when you leave the church building can you create the kingdom of heaven. Be the church. Thanks for listening. And again, thanks for your financial support and prayers that allow us to keep doing what we're doing. If we can serve you in any way, contact us at connectionchurch.org. And remember, don't just go to church, be the church.